The loss of a mother to her son is an indescribable and profound tragedy that shakes the very foundation of his existence. A mother's love is unique and irreplaceable, a constant source of warmth, comfort, and guidance. When she is taken away, a son is left grappling with an unimaginable void that no words can adequately convey. The bond between a mother and her son is woven with threads of tenderness, sacrifice, and unconditional support. She is his rock, his confidant, and his unwavering advocate. Her absence leaves him adrift, longing for her soothing presence and wise counsel. The pain of her loss cuts deep, searing through his soul and rendering him forever changed. In the wake of his mother's passing, the son is consumed by a range of emotions. Grief washes over him like a relentless tide, pulling him into depths of sorrow he never knew existed. Waves of sadness, anger, and disbelief crash upon him, threatening to engulf his very being. He yearns for her comforting embrace, her reassuring voice, and the love that flowed effortlessly between them. Memories become both a solace and a source of anguish. They are a testament to the beautiful moments they shared, but also a reminder of what has been irrevocably lost. The son clings to those memories, treasuring them like precious gems, for they are all he has left of his beloved mother. As he navigates the turbulent sea of grief, the son must find a way to honor his mother's memory and find healing. He seeks solace in the embrace of loved ones, finding strength in their shared sorrow. Gradually, he learns to carry his mother's spirit within him, drawing on her love and wisdom to navigate the challenges that lie ahead. Mom, one beautiful morning, two years after losing her son in a tragic accident, a widow heard someone knock on her door and call her, Mom, death time, 12 p.m. That is when Jane and Sean Wiley lost their only child, John. He was transported to the hospital directly from school after being stung by many bees and going into anaphylactic shock. He had messed up a beehive that was growing on the school grounds and the angry bees attacked him, putting their own lives at risk as well as his. When Jane and her husband were recalled, they were in the midst of attempting to give John a brother. The news had hit them like a bucket of cold water, and they had dressed quickly before driving to the hospital. I'm afraid I have terrible news for Miss Wiley. Your kid was in a severe accident and has been taken to the hospital, the school principal informed her. The frightened parents came just as the doctors had given up hope of saving their son. Jane raced up to the doctor as he left the ER and grabbed him. You need to get back in there and try again, she cried, frantically shaking him. Her husband was there in an instant, yanking her away from the guy while trying his best to keep himself together. It's done, Jane, he croaked, tears welling up in his eyes as he gazed at his deceased son's corpse. That tragedy rocked the marriage, and it took them almost a year merely to clean up his room. Jane would cry every time the subject was brought up. Her spouse survived better, but he too lost a piece of himself as a result of his sadness. Jane heard someone knock on the door two years after the heinous crime, and when she questioned who it was, she heard a child's voice reply, Mom, it's me. Jane realized it couldn't be her kid, but she nevertheless raced to the front door. Nobody was there, but as she glanced down, she found a little message sent to her and her husband. Did I just make it up? She pondered. No, someone had to be here since this letter didn't fall from the sky. She glanced around again for anything out of the ordinary, but when she couldn't find anything, she picked up the envelope and went back inside. Inside the mail was a letter with the address 813 Atwood Ave. What is that? Her husband said, and Jane abruptly opened her eyes. It had all been a nightmare. Jane thought a colorful one had to signify something. She hurried for a pen and paper as soon as her eyes opened to jot down the address before she forgot. The next day, Jane went to the grocery store. The exercise was something she and her late son used to do together. It was pretty joyful for her at the time. It was now simply a duty she wanted to fulfill swiftly. Jane noticed something strange as she sped through the aisles with her shopping trolley. Someone had put the identical address she had dreamed about, 813 Atwood Ave, on a giant flyer offering the services of a kid's clothing business. She thought it strange that she would stumble upon the location so soon after having a dream about it, so she went home to tell her husband. When they sat down for supper, she informed him, I had a dream last night. 
What was that all about? He inquired. She told him about the knock and the childlike voice she heard, then about the address and how she found it again at the grocery store. That's true, but I don't believe it's a reason for alarm, do you? Certainly not, Jane replied. I simply believe I'll feel better once I learn more about that location, as that dream seemed foreshadowing to me. Her spouse was apprehensive, but he backed her up. Okay, honey, we'll do some research after supper, he said. Jane discovered a message while shopping for groceries. When the dishes were done, the couple sat down at their computer to do some research. They looked up the address on the internet and discovered it was associated with foster care. More investigation showed the children were under the orphanage's care at the time. One of them stuck out to Jane, so she and her husband traveled there the next morning to meet him. His name is Simon, the owner says. He lost his parents in a car accident and has autism, which makes him difficult to be around. In fact, he rarely talks to anyone except his imaginary buddy, and he is adamant about selecting his own adoptive family. What exactly does it mean? Jane inquired, intrigued. Jane informed her husband about her dream and what she saw at the supermarket. That implies Simon is doing the adopting here, not you two. We're not here to... Sean began to speak, but a sharp punch from his wife hushed him. We'd want to meet this youngster, Jane said. When they entered the room and Jane saw Simon, she realized why she had had the dream. The youngster needed a place to live. The orphanage's founder, Mia Cochran, excused them so they could spend time alone with the youngster. Simon glanced up from the toys he was playing with as soon as she departed. My buddy thinks you're kind folks and he doesn't want you to be alone much longer. Jane and Sean were taken aback by his statements. Simon approached Jane after seeing her and her spouse. Is that your friend? Sean inquired. Certainly, my buddy. Do you also not believe me? Simon inquired. We do, honey, Jane began to say. John, Simon murmured, abruptly cutting her off. He said to introduce himself as John. It was all that the pair needed. They began the adoption procedure the next day, and Simon was put in John's old room within a week, and this is how Jane's late son helped her meet her new one. Jane heard a tap on the door again one day and a voice say, Mom, it's me. This time, though, it was not a dream. It was her son coming home from school. Jane had another son after adopting Simon from an institution. 